Yo, welcome back everybody to a brand new episode of The Shuffle Pod. We are now on episode number 24 and we have another special guest with us on today's episode. We got the two-time regional champion, Piper Lapine. What's up? Oh, not much. Uh, ready for Orlando, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, Piper is uh, a very, very good player. She's won two regionals already this season. So we definitely want to kind of get some insight on that. Talk about, you know, the deck choices she when she brought to those regionals. And maybe just talk a bit more about the meta and going forward, going into uh, Liverpool and also Orlando. And, of course, we just had San Diego. So we can also talk a little bit about what happened at San Diego. Because there were some pretty interesting things that did go down at San Diego with what decks ended up doing well. And even winning, of course, the entire tournament but of course before we do get in to this episode we do got to do our weekly recap so we'll start off here with uh lindsay here lindsay how has your week been so far so ruger is very upset at me currently mm. um because i did give him a haircut this weekend and he mm. not only does he really not like baths he really equally does not like haircuts so ruger's ruger's kind of upset uh upset with me but he is much easier to give a haircut to than Magnum. Magnum is actually kind of the worst when it comes to giving a haircut. So I have to like kind of space them out because it actually takes me like four hours to really? do it. Oh, you give so, your own yeah. dogs a haircut? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I have mm. like a whole little like I have like a whole little like kit thing and like some nice clippers. And it's because I, mm -hmm. I I used to take them to go get groomed at places, but then they kind of kept getting like kicked out of where I would take them. Really? Because prop pro, and I can see why probably because they're so anxious and so uh, they can be kind of difficult to deal with and so like the, mm. some of the places I've taken them they're like yeah you're like your dogs have like too much anxiety for us to handle I'm like great um, cool we'll figure it out together then um, oh, wow but it's my week has been pretty uneventful I've just been you know working per usual and playing a lot of Pokemon Violet catching a lot more shinies. Um, trying to farm those raids to get that shiny Herba Mystica. So I've just been playing a lot of Violet as well and trying to trying to prepare for Orlando. Um, I'm in between two decks right now, and I feel pretty comfortable with both of them. I just don't know which one I want to do mm. or which one I want to play. So I'm kind of really stuck in between those two right now. Um, I thought I was kind of sold on what I was going to play to Orlando, but I, the San Diego results kind of have me like, ooh. Yeah, so. that's very interesting. Yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at with that. Um, pretty uneventful week for me, though. But what about you, LDF? Uh, my week's been pretty uh, pretty normal. I've just been making content once again, getting ready for Crown Zenith to come out on Thursday on PCGO. Uh, but I have been doing a couple uh, things for testing for Orlando, too. Obviously, I did play in a webcam tourney that I got invited out to and actually played against Piper in the finals. Um, I was playing e Turnitus VMAX. Uh, which I, I do like right now. I think we'll talk about E-Turn a little bit more later on in the episode and kind of where it stands in the meta because it's a really interesting deck. More or less, it's a Weezing deck, which unfortunately is really good against Lost Box, which was what Piper was playing. You were playing the uh, Rayquaza Lost Box deck, yeah. It was a very interesting uh, match there, though, in the end there where you had the, the Cram Man with the Wash Energy on yeah. and it couldn't Weezing you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so testing for Orlando. Of course, Orlando is actually coming up really fast. Like, it's crazy how fast time goes. It's already the 15th of January at the time of recording this. And, like, Orlando is literally, like, nearly two and a half weeks away. So it's coming up pretty crazy. fast. Yeah, it's just crazy. So I'm getting ready for Orlando. Other than that, I've just been hanging out with my friends, just kind of doing doing my own thing with, with my buddies and uh, just catching up with uh, some old friends too that I think I've talked about in a couple episodes prior where like I reconnected with some old friends I haven't really seen in like a decade so I've been still doing that they're still into Pokemon my one friend's trying to get me to get Pokemon Scarlet and Violet um I I just like I just don't have time because it's like it's hard for me to commit time to to binge a video game right now um when I like so busy with the content stuff but I definitely still need to get Scarlet and Violet like I I don't know a lot of the the names of the Pokemon very well so when I was doing the the set review for all the cards that got revealed the other night I was, like, struggling to pronounce their names because I just, like, I'm not familiar with them because I haven't played the games yet. So I've still got to get connected with Scarlet and Violet a little bit and kind of catch up on that. But, uh, Piper, how has your week been? Uh, it's been pretty busy. Uh, last week of the semester, I missed two days for San Diego, so I had a lot to catch up on, a couple tests, quizzes. Uh, and I did play in the webcam tournament, got second, uh, and I tested it for Orlando in my free time. But, yeah, 
yeah, with Orlando coming up, we all need to get in that testing to figure out what is good, especially because Crown Zenith is going to be legal for Orlando, which I'm actually really interested to see what happens with that. Obviously, there's a couple new cards coming out, not a whole lot. I guess maybe we can talk a little bit maybe about like Crown Zenith and maybe how it'll impact the meta a little bit, because uh, there are some new cards coming out. The set isn't like super good, but there are still like a couple cards that may or may not impact the format a little bit, especially in Lost Box specifically. I think Lost Box gets a pretty big upgrade with uh, Crown Zenith. There's a couple new cards from the set that might help it. So maybe we can kind of talk about uh, that a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. Um, I Yeah, yeah, we can talk about that later. But before we get into that, remember, you guys can always ask the pod. Feel free to send your questions for the chance of them being answered on next week's podcast. All you have to do is send it to podcast at the shuffle squad dot com. You can also send us suggestions, topic ideas you'd like to hear, even recommend guests that you want to see coming up on the podcast. So. We'll dive into the, these commercials real quick, so make sure you guys are going to atlascollectibles.com and using your code TSS12 because that can save you 12% on sealed Pokemon products, singles, bulk, anything, anything you want, um, ships worldwide. And especially with Crown Zenith coming up, if you guys want to replenish your PTCGO codes with that, you can use code TSS5, save yourself 5%, and get yourself some Crown Zenith codes. And lastly, your playmat. If you want a custom playmat, you can upload your own image. You can also purchase some TSS-inspired swag there as well. If you use that code TSS5YP, you save yourself 5%. And all of this directly helps support us here at the Shuffle Squad, where we can keep making lovely podcast episodes just for you. So, with that being said, are you guys ready to guess that Pokemon? Yeah, I think I'm good to go. All right, so this puzzle, as always, was brought to you by PokeX Word, the best place to get your fill of Pokemon-inspired puzzles. And new puzzles are posted every single day. So they uh, launch their online version of Guess That Pokemon. They have it on their website, PokeXWord.com. And make sure to follow them on Twitter because they give away a ton of codes every single month. So who doesn't love some free codes? Exactly. So we'll go ahead and dive in. This one is kind of silly. I don't know if we've done this one before, but... You have a Pokemon that you guys need to guess, and you're, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll do the, the six, it's six letters, so I'll give you the letters. There's six letters, and it is in Gen 7. Gen 7, that's uh, Sun and Moon, okay. okay. Sun and Moon. Hmm. I'm not too familiar with the Sun and Moon era, unfortunately. I never really, I never played those games, um kind of stopped after black and white but sun and moon seven so sun seven. and moon the alolan that's when the alolan, alolan style pokemon i think that was like the first time that they were like remaking new pokemon or remaking old pokemon right yeah yeah, yeah it was yeah, yeah to the alolan yeah uh what do we got here seven letters D seven the six letters gen seven does six alone, letters like count in the letters like could it still be Vulpix? like it's it it's not an alolan pokemon it's not an okay. alolan so there's <laughs> okay. no like alolan but yeah Vulpix okay. is a good guess but it is not Vulpix. yeah i wasn't sure if that counted like <laughs> yeah. yeah uh what do we got here is it rowlet good guess it is not rowlet mm. i'll go ahead and give you guys the next hint here it is a fairy type is it comfy it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> it is. It I is. forgot the first Comfy thing that was came to my there. head. I'm like, you said it was a You're weird... like, there's no way she would pick that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you said it was a weird one, and we were talking about uh, the Lost Box. Or, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is, it is, it is. And I, I, I do want to read the Pokedex uh, entry, the little flavor text, because I love those. And it's, it's kind of cute. Um, so this is the one specifically from Moon from from the moon game this is the pokedex entry because they are different between sun and moon so moon's pokedex entry is baths prepared with the flowers from its vine have a relaxing effect so this pokemon is a hit with many people I don't know flower moons, picking but... yeah. <laughs> yeah how are you like picking the flowers off of this pokemon and uh yeah do they yeah. regrow back i mean that's what i'm saying yeah that's that's questions questions we want to know <laughs> I kind of forgot Comfy was Gen 7. I was thinking it was Gen 6. I think I'm getting that and Klefki mixed up. That's yeah. probably what it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I always forget that um, Copperaja is Gen 8. Mm-hmm. I always forget that. 
Yeah. Always yeah. forget that. But I'm definitely getting good at Guess That Pokemon, especially on the PokeX Word website. I've been getting some pretty good scores recently. I've been posting those to Twitter, so. If anyone wants to keep up or try to try to beat Lindsay's score, there you go. It ain't gonna happen. It ain't gonna happen. The Poke but X Word we master. Can. We <laughs> Poke X Word, the best place to get your fill of Pokemon inspired puzzles. New puzzles are posted every day, and they recently launched a new Guess That Pokemon puzzle, which is a ton of fun to play. Go check them out at PokeXWord.com and be sure to follow them on Twitter for your chance to win a ton of PTCGO codes every month. We can kind of move on to more of the main topic type of conversation here. There is, so we do have an Ask the Pod question for today. And I did kind of, we usually kind of do this in the beginning, but I wanted to save this one to more of the main topic because it, it, this is a really good question and it's going to be a, a lot of discussion around it. So we have a question that was submitted by James. So thank you for listening, James. Thank you for your support and thank you for submitting us a question. So James says, hey, Shuffle Squad, my son Peyton, eight, eight years old, will be playing in his first junior regional in Knoxville this February. We're both newer to the Pokemon scene, having just been learning and playing over this past year. I'm curious for any advice you have for someone playing in their first regional, specifically junior regional, as well as any advice for spectators like I'll be. Any advice on preparation beforehand or what to expect or prepare for much prepare for is much appreciated. Then we also have a shout out LDF. My son and hey. I love watching your YouTube channel and have had a blast building and playing the decks we've watched on your content. So That's this awesome. is kind of a big question. Mm -hmm. So first off, Peyton, we wish you the best of luck on your regional. Um, there's <laughs> there's no feeling like your first regional. It's 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 pretty exciting. It's pretty cool. You're just like in mm -hmm. a big big area, big big room with a bunch of people who like the same stuff as you. So it's it's a really mm -hmm. awesome experience. So I guess first question is if there's any advice for someone playing in their first regional. Since it is your first regionals, uh, don't like be stressed about uh, winning or like top cutting or getting a huge accomplishment. Just like play something fun that you know what like you know how to play because then you're gonna have a more enjoyable time and that's like really the more important aspect than trying to win your first regionals it can be pretty intimidating to go to your first tournament obviously it's a different environment it, like it's different than going to your locals and you know playing at your locals like a like a regional level tournament it's a lot it's it, it's definitely more difficult because you're playing against people from all over the place uh the yeah the difficulty is higher so you don't want to put too much pressure on yourself going into a tournament like this and like oh, i want to win you know i want to get you know top cut play something that you are comfortable with obviously it's a big one too you definitely want to play something that you know you want to play don't just play something that like you might have just seen the night before or like a week before and you haven't tested that much just because you want to play it or whatever just play something that you you yourself know how to play something that you know can you know how how to play it and what it can do against all like the other top decks make sure it's tested and yeah just just make sure you know what you're playing to its full degree and kind of master the deck that you want to play like going to regionals picking what you want to play like a day or two before and not really getting as much testing in on it is not a good idea you definitely want to think ahead as to what you want to play because you you know that what you bring is going to be very important and if the more you play a deck and the more comfortable you're with the deck and the more matchups and how to approach different situations with a certain deck in a tournament like this the easier it'll be to play and you'll have an easier time especially in best two of three which is something very important to note a lot of tournaments that you may play in are best of one which is a lot more you know it's a bit more easier you know it's a little bit more easier to like win games in best of one because sometimes your opponent just has a bad draw for a turn and best of three can be a lot more difficult because yeah your opponent had one game or maybe they drew poorly and then the next game they go first and they also do not draw poorly so best of three is a little bit more challenging and that's a big reason why you always want to make sure you know what you're playing and you're comfortable with your playing and you know your matchups very well and um yeah it, you ought to have fun most importantly there's a lot of you know a lot of people there you're probably going to meet a lot of you know other you know big name people at this tournament so it'll be a, it's a great great time you'll have a lot of fun you might make some friends if you're going and a couple of your friends might be going too it's just a really good time so i would say first more make sure you have fun and then, you know, you can worry about the competitive aspect a little bit later. And depending on how well you do in the tournament, you can also learn from your mistakes, learn from what you did. 
uh, another big yeah, another big piece of advice learn learn from your mistakes and uh, figure out you know what what went wrong during each game maybe you know kind of talk it out with your with your dad and maybe just figure out like okay what went wrong what could i have done differently in this match what could i have done differently in this scenario and then when you go to your next regionals you can learn from those mistakes and then you can apply that to your next regionals but Lindsay, do you have any piece of advice you want to give yeah, I guess because my, my first regionals was honestly not even that long ago. Uh, my first mm. one was in Indy, Indianapolis in, what, last year, 2021? So I would say bring snacks. Okay, bring snacks. <laughs> mm. Because in between, so you can't, so like you can't play like, or you can't eat while you're playing. Uh, that mm -hmm. is like part of the rules plus with like the COVID protocols they have, you know, you're supposed to be wearing your masks and they don't want drinks or anything on the table. So bring snacks. Okay, I'm a big snacker. So it's important to keep your brain fueled in between matches. So I would definitely recommend bringing some snacks. Um, I would, I would, I would practice timed matches. I think that's something that I wish I did a little bit more before mm -hmm. my first regional is set a timer and, you know, time how long it takes for me to look through my deck on the first deck search time yeah. out, how long it takes for me to figure out how, what my prizes are in that first deck search. Um, and really just paying attention to the time aspect of it because they do have like those big like kind of the the red like digital clocks like around everywhere but you mm -hmm. might not be in a place where you can see them and it the time the time can be like the the hardest part to master sometimes is just being able to not take too long um regionals mm -hmm. I'm, i don't know about any juniors who are going to be getting you know upset at this but some some people can get upset if you know if you're taking more than than what is it uh 15 seconds per action yeah is yeah, that like people, what the average yeah 15 20 seconds like people then think you're slow playing right you don't want to you want you don't want to be known as that person but also yeah you don't want to you don't want to play too slow because yeah your opponent can get very frustrated and they'll be like uh can you play a little bit faster please you don't want to kind of be in that like awkward scenario right right and again i don't really i don't necessarily think any eight-year-old juniors are going to be too concerned about that but no. that's just that's just some good uh, first time regional advice and you know just just like these two said just have fun it's really more about the experience than it is anything else so we're super excited that you get to go to your first regional and I mean, I'll see you in Knoxville. I think yeah, LD, if you're going I'm to going, Knoxville, right? Yeah, yeah, I was able to get in. Are you Piper, going? Piper? Are you going to Knoxville? Oh, I think so. I'm pretty sure. I, I'm registered. Yeah, um, you just gotta work out the flights, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So we'll I, we'll see you in Knoxville. Yeah, I actually I did kind of want to elaborate more on what you were talking about there with the other like the food and then the the keeping track of time. So yeah, for like with food and drinks, like I I'm the type of person who goes to a regional and doesn't eat all day. Like I don't know, I play better when I'm like when I'm not eating. Like I don't know, I could literally go probably like 10 12 hours without eating food and oh I would play better. Gosh. Yeah, like I don't know how I do it. I do always have a drink though. Uh, very important to make sure, like, if you're not going to eat, which I still recommend you eat, obviously, but definitely, like, bring, make sure you have, like, a drink on you. They they usually have, like, drinks in the vendors, um, you know, usually they'll have, like, pop or, you know, Gatorade or something. Like, at Baltimore, for example, I think I had, like, five or six Gatorades the entire day to kind of keep me energized because <laughs> I also didn't get a lot of sleep that night either. Um, but, yeah, definitely, like, make sure you're eating and drinking and just always have a drink on you in each game. You just put your drink like on the floor beside you and, you know, in between turns, just take a sip of your drink. Just I don't keep, even think you can do it. that in between turns. I think you're not allowed to like touch not any of that stuff. I think you are. You, I think you're allowed to like have a drink, like probably like on the ground beside you, but you can't put it on mm. your table, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, definitely that. And then obviously with the, <laughs> with the time aspect too. Yeah. Very important to keep track of time because it's interesting because at my first, uh, tournament, which was NEIC, uh, even though I've been playing TCGO for so long, I never really gotten that IRL experience as much. And NEIC, I did get, a, did get quite a few ties, uh, at NEIC. And then at Baltimore, I got, I think three ties. I think I almost got, no, I got two ties. I almost got three ties because in my winning in, I let my opponent have the win because I couldn't win. I could have tied, but I let the opponent win. Um, but the nice thing is in Toronto, I didn't get a single tie the entire day. 
Um, I was playing a Lugia deck, obviously, so like I guess games can go a little bit quicker, but that's one thing that I was proud of about my Toronto performance is I didn't get a single tie because I made sure to play fast enough and to keep track of time. And if you don't like have a like a watch on you or anything, you obviously you're not allowed to pull your phone in like during the match. Um, one thing to note is like maybe like the table around you sometimes when you notice the table starts to get a little bit more dead and people get up, that's when you maybe know like you might want to play a little bit faster because a lot of the games around you are finishing, which means um, you know, time is going to get called soon. So at that point, you can play faster. But yeah, definitely don't play too slow. You don't want your opponent to accuse you of slow playing. That can be very bad. And um, yeah, just you don't want to be in that scenario. Definitely try to play at a reasonable pace and uh, just try to try to keep track of everything while you're playing so that you're able to play fast enough where you don't get, you know, ties. Because ties can be killer. They can be. You get stuck into. You can get stuck in the draw land, or not yeah. the draw land. The um, the tie land where mm -hmm. you start. You start just to hit everyone who had all the ties before you, and then like that's yeah. what happened to me in in, in D. I, I had the one tie, and then I matched up with somebody who was like three, three one like three or something ridiculous, and I'm like, oh goodness. <laughs> so. Yeah. We can kind of talk a little bit before, like any advice on preparation. But we kind of like went over this a little bit. Any advice on preparation beforehand, or what to expect or prepare for um, as well? So we kind of, again, we kind of did talk a little bit about this. I would make sure that you have plenty of sleeves. I would get brand new sleeves. Mm -hmm. You got to get brand new sleeves right before, um, right before the regional. Um, you know, whatever type you, you end up using. I know I have like a bunch of different Lagoon Dragon Shield sleeves. And I know they say like sometimes if you're like mixing up different like boxes, like if you have like a Lagoon sleeve from one box and like take a new Lagoon sleeve from another box, is that like, and it's possible they could be slightly different colors. So it's, I've heard that you should just get one new brand new box of sleeves and that's what mm -hmm. you should use. And Making sure you're checking your sleeves in between the rounds as well. Yeah. Again, little tiny eight-year-old hands. I can't imagine they're going to be like destroying mm -hmm. some sleeves. But yeah. that's something that's important too is checking your sleeves in between the rounds. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Oh. yeah, you can go. You can go. On, on sleeves, I would recommend Dragon Shields. Um, I would go against using the dual mats. Uh, I've had a lot of issues with them. And I've mm. had the same thing where like you mix two boxes of dual mats and then they are the like black on one side colored on the other one. And then those ones are really obviously different. But when I have like sapphires or just like full one color, they work pretty well. So I kind of stopped using dual mats despite the colors definitely being better. Oh, the colors are so much better. But I know I, I yeah, the, they are split city central over there. It's like they always just kind of peel around the corners and. Yeah, especially the new ones, the Fury yeah. and the Ember ones, which sucks because I like the colors, but yeah, they, they peel way too easily. I like I really, the, the snow. Snow's good. But. Yeah, I, I really wanted to use Peaches for Worlds, and then I opened the first box, sleeved my deck, and then one side was just like very obviously marked, switched sleeves to my second box of Peaches, and then like the plastic did not meet the top of the sleeve on any of them, so it was like very in heights. So then I went to Sapphires, and those are great. Um, I think I used them at Worlds in Baltimore and split like one sleeve. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to get some regular dual or some, some regular dual mat, some, uh, some just like the regular dragon shield and yeah, probably get those. I recommend ivory. Ivories are nice. Ivory those are the ones ivory. I use. Yeah. I use them at San Diego and Toronto. I'm yeah. so scared to use anything that's not like just the black. Cause I'm scared that if I get like a little scuff on the ivory ones, I'm like mm. not going to see it. And they're going to be like, Oh my God, you're marking cards. That's just what goes through my brain sometimes. Mm hmm. I'm no, I haven't been a spectator, so I'm not too sure. I guess just like, you know, be on snack duty. Be on snack duty. Yeah. Um, just make sure that, you know, you don't have to like necessarily like watch Peyton play the entire time necessarily. But at the same time, you know, like just being that support person that it seems like yeah. you already are. So yeah. I would say from my experience in juniors, if you want to watch the game, I'd recommend not doing that. I would just stay a bit further away from the tables. Uh, there have been issues like in the past with uh, people just watching games too closely. Uh, it yeah. happened like when I was a junior. Uh, I think there's been some stuff recently. Like don't you don't need to be like hovering over watching the game. Uh, that also mm -hmm. induces like unneeded pressure. And a tip that we found uh, worked very well is when there is a lunch break, 
get the food during that the round before and then there's like no lines um so you don't have to deal with like a thousand people trying to get lunch at the same time that's the that's the good spectator information for sure yeah it's pretty good advice going get the food before lunch break so you don't have to wait in a line yeah yeah that'd be really helpful as yeah. well um and then bring lots of money to buy nice fun things um they have yeah. a lot of that's something that i didn't necessarily mm. know about regionals before i went is that they have a ton of vendors inside the area like where you can buy cards you can buy like cute little stuffed animals and stuff yeah i know i have a ton of bulk that i need to bring with me to orlando and luckily i'm driving because it's not too far of a drive for me so i'm gonna be like we're gonna be like piling up the car with all the bulk so <laughs> Yeah. So before we kind of like dive into a lot of these accomplishments that you've had, what, when, how old were you when you first started playing and what got you playing in kind of the more, I know it wasn't like as competitive back then, but the competitive yeah. side of it. Um, I started playing like December, 2012. So I think I was like eight. Um, but mm. basically it was kind of going around my school cards. Uh, and then my parents took me to a league to learn how to play. Uh, and then about I was playing like very pseudo competitively, just like local events and stuff, uh, not like with the best decks um, for like six months. And then Worlds was in uh, Vancouver, BC. That was 2013 Worlds, which was a six hour drive for us because I still lived in Portland then. So we drove up because my family loves BC. Um, and then we went to Worlds and that kind of like, got me into playing competitive because I'm like, I want to go to Worlds next year. Then I started playing, played better decks, did well, uh, and I was able to sneak into top order regionals and get my invite. And then that was 2014, which was DC. And then the next year I started like playing full competitive um, and I got top 16 and then I've kind of been doing pretty well since then. So then you, this was your first season in Masters, right? Uh, the, the last year, like the 2022? The first only, season. only the post-COVID part. I was in my last year's seniors before COVID, and then I got aged up over. So it's like first season. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so just, I mean, just with that time being in Masters, I don't know if people listening slash watching understand the insane amount of accomplishments that piper has gotten in masters yeah. but i mean started with top 64 at euic then top 32 at indianapolis in 2022 top 32 at naic we got the baltimore regional champion and then if that wasn't enough for you the toronto regional champion and mm. i i think i saw something on twitter about it but i just thought it was <laughs> A little, a little interesting how it's. Oh, okay. Piper can win two regionals and still not have, not have worlds her in invite. Play. Yeah, <laughs> which is yeah. kind of like. Mm -hmm. It's a little, <laughs> little sus. Yeah, no, for sure. Every couple of weeks, someone just like tweets it, and then like a bunch <laughs> of people like bring. It. I don't know. It's it's interesting to watch. I don't know. Like, to be fair, I feel pretty confident I could have gotten my invite anyway. But like, I think it's more like demoralizing for other people because I, I i've just seen a lot of people be like uh, i i don't know because i feel like not many people i think there was a statistic that not very many people had won two regionals in one season so it's like right it, with the 500 point threshold if winning two regionals isn't enough for that like it's going to be very difficult to do that if you're not going to like a ton of regionals to place well at a bunch or at because it's like bfl6 um, I saw a statistic. If you go to four regionals, top four, three of them, top eight, a fourth, you don't have your invite, which wow. is so weird. <sighs> that is. That is kind of weird. And I know with, you know, league, league and cups and all that kind of stuff. And the, it's not back yet. Did they ever even say it was well, like be it should be this I season? Don't... I, I know they just said 2023, but the, 2023 could I mean, be next season too. Yeah. I don't think that they necessarily specifically said, I think everyone, I don't know if they, I don't think they specifically said January of 2023. That's just what everyone yeah. else has said. Yeah. I think if they were going to start them up, they'd be, they'd do it at the beginning of a quarter. I don't think they do it mid uh, stipend season. So yeah. if, if they are bringing them back, I think they'd bring them back after OCIC. If they don't, I don't think they're doing it till next season. If yeah. even then, I don't know. 
Like, unless they do it with, like, rotation, maybe. But then again, it's like we're already kind of that late into the season anyways, you know? Yeah, because rotation's mid-April. There's, like, a month and a half of events left, and then NAIC, like... Yeah. At that point, they're just... I think there gets to a point where it just has to be next season. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, yeah, one of those things where it's keeps... I don't know if it keeps getting pushed back or if, like, again, I, I, I'm not sure if they ever really actually announced a date. I just know that there was a year announced and it was the yeah. year of 2023. So mm-hmm. we got a long year ahead of us to, to tell. Yeah, we definitely you know. do. So I kind of want to talk more about the... I don't know which one I want to talk about first. I guess we'll do the Baltimore Regional. Talk about that one first. Um, since you won that one first, so I know that's when you were doing, you were playing the Radiant Charizard. And was that was that the Inteleon Radiant Charizard? Yeah. Or were you playing? Okay, that's what I thought. I was like, I don't think I don't think that it was the Lost Box Charizard. No, but, this is like- so the Inteleon Radiant Charizard. Yeah. So like, how long did it take for you? How long were you preparing with that deck? And that's like before you decided that that's what you were going to play. Um, I had, I took the, I saw Ross Cawthon play it like the day before Worlds. Uh, and I got the list off the stream. I didn't end up playing it because I wasn't like, I, I messed with the list a bit too much. Um, cause I'm like, oh, five energies. That's weird. Um, so my list was suboptimal and then it wasn't testing the best, uh, and then I went back to it for Baltimore. Um, I didn't play that many games with it. I didn't have a whole lot of time. Like, started my senior year. Uh, so I didn't test a whole lot. I'm just like, this deck looks fun to play. I like playing one prize Inteleon decks. So I just went with it. Um, it was a really good deck. I definitely got mm-hmm. carried by the deck being really good. Uh, I think just mm. the big thing is just knowing your lines and sequencing with it. And I played um, Liminal, like, just one prize box in Teleonto Worlds, and I tested that a ton. So I had a lot of confidence with the sequencing and whatnot. Yeah, that deck does require a lot of, like, sequencing and, like, playing, like, very optimally because there's so many things you have to do with that deck. And it is a bit more of, like, a, I guess, like a, like a big brain deck uh, to play. Um, I guess one question I have about the Radiant Charizard deck, were you ever scared about the Flying Pikachu matchup? Because there was a lot of Flying Pikachu at Baltimore. Uh, no, so I played Escape Rope, which made it, like, really good. I can go Escape Rope Boss or Double Cross Switcher, mm. or Double Double Cross Switcher. Okay. Um, and if they don't do that, I can always go Belt Inteleon, Belt Inteleon, Zigzagoon Ping. Mm, uh, I just had true. a lot of, like, routes to killing the Pikachu. Like, I could go Zard, Belt, Triple Goon Ping, uh, Escape Rope Boss, or Escape Rope Switchers. Like, I don't, I don't know. It, it was a bit scary. I think it was one of the scarier matchups but mm-hmm. i still think it was like slightly favored how many did you end up playing that day or that um, weekend i should say i think i only played two in day one the deck really didn't do well day two um yeah it didn't yeah yeah it was in, i hit them in like the first half of day one and i think i lost one of the games but i scooped that game in like three turns after i got Marnie to a dead hand uh but mm-hmm. yeah Okay, yeah, because I I play against five flying Pikachu day one when I was on Reggie's, so I, I guess like the deck just didn't have like the best like conversion rate going into day two. I think yeah, yeah, there wasn't like that many flying Pikachu decks doing that good. So I guess if you're if you're going if you're doing really well day one, then you kind of dodge all the Pikachus that are you know either going like you know X three or X two and then kind of just falling behind. Yeah, that's true. Because a lot of people did yeah. bring Pikachu to Baltimore because a lot of people kind of net decked uh andre's mm-hmm. list from worlds right to play the the adp deck so yeah yeah i don't think the deck is the best choice into the meta because palkia lists were adapting so that it could win yeah. uh it wasn't even that good of a matchup for peak beforehand like palkia wins the coin flip uh doesn't have a bad hand it's in a really good spot uh it was yeah. pretty close to 50 50 if not like maybe slightly favor for pikachu um and then i think the highest pikachu ended up being like top thir- like low top 32 or high top 64 or something like that Hmm. Yeah, I know with Pikachu winning and AIC as well as people were really, um, really hopping on it. And I think that I, I do think that a lot of people are going to possibly bring it back for maybe more of the Liverpool or Orlando, just with a lot of these um, basic Pokemon kind of seeing a little bit more play, like with mm-hmm. the Rayquaza or with the, the Raikou and the Lost Boxes and the Lugias. So we'll see 
We'll see if Pikachu is going to make a little bit of a comeback or not. Yeah, we'll definitely um, talk about that. I think kind of going a bit later about like talking about San Diego because there was a flying Pikachu deck technically in top eight at San Diego. So yeah, see, I, I mean, that and... one's a duck. Yeah, it was definitely a deck. It, it was a deck that was mm-hmm. in top eight of San Diego. <laughs> yeah. But I know for the um, for the Toronto regional, I I was watching on stream and I heard you say that you were kind of planning that deck for like a month before you kind of had like more you're like okay yeah we're gonna we're gonna go in with the Mewtwo that's what we're gonna do and it's you had that whole month to prepare so how were those experiences kind of different with you know having a deck that you know you know you obviously know how the Inteleon engine works and you know how you, you said that you like playing the single prize Inteleon decks but not necessarily having as many reps with that specific deck beforehand versus mm-hmm. A regional where you had an entire month where you're like, I'm playing this deck. Yeah, I mean, I had a lot more time off between uh, those. Also, it wasn't like the start. It was like midway through the semester, so I didn't have like a whole lot of work uh, to do. So I had a lot more time to test. We figured out that just like there is a lot of special energy reliance. Like Mew is just four DTEs. Lugia is like 14 to 16 special energies. So Quadi Beltal, they can't do much against that. And then... We're like, okay, Ice Q Wash seem, seems like very mid against Lost Box. So we just went with the B Union. Uh, it, it like the, it doesn't lose to random jank. Like Sanders control is definitely could have at, uh, at LAIC. Uh, we, were, we were considering getting flights to LAIC with how confident we were in the deck. Like we were very confident. Um, and... I don't know. We were we we were also really scared of Sander doing well at LAIC with control, mm-hmm. which he did, but it ended up not mattering because um, we're like, oh, people aren't even going to respect it because um, Tord beat it in top eight. They're going to be like, oh, Tord beat it. It's probably fine. No one's going to play it. Uh, so yeah, not many people respected it and ended up going pretty well. So what differences did you had between your version of the control versus Sander's version? Uh, his NAIC Mewtwo or the LAIC one because the LAIC one he played did not have a uh, Mewtwo it was just like uh his his lost box win condition was Ice Q or a green Pidgeot loop uh, oh, so I'm thinking I'm thinking of his NAIC one then. yeah yeah that, that makes yeah so um we played less item based consistency yeah we, we didn't play tracking shoes because we need to fit in EVL talls uh that was a big thing that took up a ton of space for EVL tall for twins um we had some, I think our supporter line was better because he played like two research, two Avery. It was a really weird supporter line. Um, ours was a bit more streamlined. We had Marnie for disruption. Marnie was a great card all weekend. Uh, we also had Serena, which is like a pseudo consistency, pseudo gust. Um, both effects were really good. Uh, Miss, For- Miss Fortune Sisters, a uh, fantastic card. Yeah. Uh, I think that was the MVP Dirty. of my deck. <laughs> uh, really? I yeah, I won... Mew is not the best matchup if they are if they play Silene Palpad because they'll just Silene uh, one heads put the Palpad back until they get two heads, um, and then it, it's it's not very good if they keep doing that because eventually they'll get enough uh, power tablets to one shot your Mewtwo or enough Echoing Horns to take six prizes. So mm-hmm. you can miss Fortune Sisters to uh, like dig through their deck, just get rid of a bunch of stuff, and if they don't immediately draw the Palpad then you can get rid of the Palpad, and that just wins you the game there. Um, it, it definitely won me one of the games, one or two of the games against Mew, but yeah, very good card. It also is good against Lost Box with Drapion, because yeah. you get rid of their Mirage Gates, so they can't pull it out of nowhere. Yeah, that's true. It's uh, it, I think it was a really good meta call, because I remember, felt like the entire, like, day one, day two, I was watching, because I remember I was watching you at the top tables at day two at Toronto, and I just saw you kept moving up with the Mewtwo, and a lot of a lot of the big players were like scared because like it was a really good meta call for Toronto. I think not a lot of people expected Mewtwo to come back in the format. I think a lot of people might have just been turned off by like I guess something like Drapion or even like sometimes the Evil Tall. I guess could be a little annoying if they play like an answer to the to the Mewtwo. They could just Evil Tall you. So I think I don't know. A lot of people didn't, didn't see the Mewtwo coming, which I think is just really good. A lot of people kind of just expected the the Sander control deck with the Eldegoss mm-hmm. and the Greedon and the the ice cube well, stuff to well, be more doesn't, popular. Doesn't Mewtwo's ability prevent the amazing destruction anyways? Well, they, some lists play Path or Cologne. Or I think that was... Mm. Yeah, some lists were starting to play Path or Cologne. I think that was after that event. Um, but there's Espeon, which was kind of awkward. 
But yeah. um, that, that really only dealt with Sander control. I 2 0 an SB on Lugia day one, and then I lost to Bradner. But we went to game three, and I bricked. I went draw pass, draw pass. Uh, so I don't know. I definitely could have pulled out game three. Uh, the rushing Mewtwo, like, they can't do a whole lot if you're able to set it up quickly. Um, so the Espeon isn't actually that big of a, uh, like, it's not that important. Also, it's like, you can go boss, gal, or mine it, uh, which is pretty bad for them, because you just have no energies in play, it can't attack. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a really good call. I don't blame people for not respecting it, because uh, Lost Origin meta, it was a horrible play. You just couldn't beat mm -hmm. Tina. We tried it. Um, we had a really weird list that played, like, I think we went to no Silene and we just uh, were gonna Pidgeot loop them, mm. um, and just like spam. I don't I don't remember exactly how it worked, but we we had a really weird list. Um, and but then uh, Tina kind of just got like it, it got kicked out of the meta by Lugia. So yeah, we were, <laughs> I feel we were like, like Tina oh, got like, kicked yeah. out of the meta by Tina. <laughs> Sometimes I feel that way. <laughs> but was this kind of like your? How how experienced or how familiar were you with playing control decks at this point? Did you play a lot of control? Um, I think like in seniors, I started to play a lot of control because I realized that like the average senior isn't the best at playing against control. And if I knew what I was doing, I could beat the higher level seniors as well. But uh, like control is just very good in uh, pre COVID though. To be fair, like. Yeah, it was like Pidgeot um, Guru, right? Yeah, Pidgeot, Eggrow, and Expanded, stuff like that. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I've had a lot of con uh, like a lot of practice with Control. I do enjoy playing Control decks. Like if I play old formats, I try to play more of the Locky decks or whatnot. Um, when I cube, I try to build Control decks because I find that very fun. Uh, I, I don't know. Like I'm not a Control person. Like I don't just only play Control or play Control whenever I can. But I do enjoy playing it, um, I would say. Yeah, it's a pretty good deck to kind of master. Because it, it Control can be a deck that, like, just kind of sneaks in at the right time and does well. Like you did with Mewtwo, right? Not a lot of people expected yeah. Mewtwo. And then, right, you, know, you were able to win Toronto with it. Because not a lot of people really prepared for Mewtwo. They were teching more for Sanders deck. Or they were, you know, kind of trying to respect the Articuno with, like, the Espeon. So, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely... Definitely, uh, control is a great deck to master. I mean, Sander, like Sander's control decks are always like really off the wall. Like sure. his, like his version of control more or less tends to be like something that like nobody would ever think of. Like playing like the Evil Tall and the Mewtwo, it's something that I guess like is already kind of an established thing. But Sander will bring like the most wackiest way to play control and like do well with it. <laughs> like he's been innovating really well with Mewtwo yeah. Union. I mean, got that Gengar Mewtwo Gardevoir Serena deck that I don't think is very good anymore. Maybe, but I mean at the time, no. probably yeah. good for the term and he played it too. And you're see when you don't play Crushing Hammers, um, your opponent <laughs> just benches Drapion and you basically pick up the cards. You can't do a whole lot against that. Um, yeah. My friend Bodhi won seniors at Toronto with the uh, Articuno and Teleon stuff, and there were like a couple Mewtwo players in that event, but they didn't play Hammer, so he just went bench Drapion, uh, and he was attacking <laughs> with his Inteleon, so mm -hmm. then he just went attach, 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 and then the game was basically over. Uh, a one, I... a two, a three. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I hit uh, Charlie in top eight, and I just mm -hmm. went, uh, I, I was able to just crushing Hammer, because it, it, over four turns, I'm going to hit like one to two heads, and then I'm going to be able to Silene stuff, and... Um, Inteleon is only doing 120. Like, if I'm just removing the energies from the Inteleon, they can't attach a Drapion. Otherwise, I can go, like, Serena hit for 300. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mewtwo is not a fair card. It's, it's pretty not dirty. not a 300 yeah. damage attack. No, I know. And the spread attack is in the ability. Yeah, it's a pretty yeah. <laughs> pretty nasty card. <laughs> yeah, because I, I remember at Toronto, I was talking to Jake. I was like, okay, so Jake, how, how are you going to beat Piper in top eight? And Jake, I, he even said this on stream. He's like, oh, it's an auto win. Like, I think Jake was like, I go Sobble, attach water, uh, Palkia V-Star to the Sobble, Thornton Drapion out of nowhere, which I, I guess would have been like a, a cool way to, I guess, knock out the Mewtwo. I mean... But i don't i don't think that works that well i don't know if he'd seen any of my games because like i i play crushing hammers i mean i i he didn't play melanie so if i'm just crusher mm, crush, crushing true. hammering whatever he's attacking with like you, you're gonna have to use your b-star power mm -hmm. i don't know like i can just go into mill tank and be like okay you have to attack with an inteleon now um and it's just, i don't know i don't think that works as well as he thought I guess, like, if I played No Crushing Hammer, I'm sure it would work, but 
Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, crushing hammer is very pivotal in that deck because you need to yeah. yeah you need to stop the Drapion from attacking and yeah that's true. Yeah, it's it's I don't know if I could ever play a control deck like that. It's like ugh. I even struggle playing against them. I feel like I if I ever hit one on the ladder. Which I probably should like stop doing, but I feel like whenever I hit one or something like online, I'm like, you know what? I like do not even want to like do this right now. Like I don't even want to like try. <laughs> yeah, Post that's almost... ladder was so fun. Everyone was playing Mewtwo, so I just went um, Galarian Moltres B, Baby Galarian Moltres, free matchup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's we can kind of transition talking about like the San Diego regionals and the results from that and kind of how we think it's going to shape the next couple of regionals coming up. It's ah, Beakable. Is I don't it a really want to like. I really like don't want to like deal with that. Like I don't know about y'all, but like I really I don't want to deal with Beakable. It's it's a very high roll deck. Um, yeah, some yeah. people in our group tested it and they were not like consistently beating Lugia. Uh, it should not be that close of a matchup for what Beakable is. Uh, like, the, the entire, like, I don't know. It, it's weird. Lugia should not have that good of a matchup into Beakable for the cards in that deck. I feel like it kind of needs Crushing Hammer in order to have a, a if closer matchup with Lugia. Because I agree. I feel like you can really kind of attach double turbo, double turbo at that point. And you're, you know, mm -hmm. if you have a belt, which, like, I guess you can't put on if you're getting item locked, but... Even then, I feel like it's it's really not like the absolute worst matchup in the world. I've beaten Vika Volts just from manually attaching before, and they're not like one shotting whatever I had in the active with the item locking. So I feel like Crushing Hammer would actually make that deck like pretty annoying. I mean, the mm. other issue is like Lugia goes first, gets one Archeops in the discard pile. Even if you get the turn one um, Vika attack, if they get turn two one Archeops, they're fine. Like they, yeah, they don't yeah. need that much. They can just, no. like, if they have an attachment, they just go DT powerful, knock out your beak bolt, and it's, like, yep. basically game over. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah I, I don't know if the Vigable deck is, like, great. Um, I, I, I mean, that's the thing, like, it's a very, yeah, very high roll deck. You got the Raikou, the Aerodactyl, the 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 Vigable. And the Vigable's, like, not, like, great either a lot of the time, because, like, your deck is very, like, suboptimal. I think you might have a better Mew matchup than a better Lugia matchup with that deck, to be honest. Just because um, you can, you go Ditto, Drapion, yeah, and R I, Raikou chase like Genesect. Depends if they play a uh, Lost City or not. Yeah, yeah, they have the Lost um, City or the yeah. Like the Mew player, I feel like on stream they played really weird. Uh, like game two, they benched, they Ultra Balled for an Orcorio while only having one Mew in play, and then mm. uh, Gibby went like bench Drapion, double cross switch your Mew. And then killed their only mute, and they still ended up winning. I don't know how that happened. Uh, I was like kind of watching, kind of not watching because it's a watching Beakable is very boring. I will say that, but <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I like I don't know how many people played the deck, but there was only like one or two in day two, and I feel like it's a deck that a lot of people would play. I don't know. Like, there's just those decks that some people or that like I feel like a lot of people would play. Um, it was kind of like. Gengar in Salt Lake City. It's like it's not a good deck, but it beats Mew, and people don't want to play Mew. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and it I I kind of forgot how like how diverse the top eight was. Like it looks like the only like two rep uh, repeating decks were the the Lhasa and Rayquaza box. Yeah. Um. I mean the Arceus Duraludon. I'm not even sure if. Duraludon is something that really necessarily needs to be respected or not. It's it's good, but yeah, I don't know. I'm on the fence on Arcdura. It's it's a lot of people just don't play because it it's like boring to play, and I don't even know if it really even beats Lugia consistently, right? Because they have the it, evil it call and the lost vacuum now. Uh, it's it's yeah, I, it's like not like. <laughs> yeah, I played one at a uh, San Diego. Um, I was playing Lugia. I think the game, both games, were done in like ten minutes. Uh, I did win. Um, mm -hmm. Game one, I went first. They went start Arceus. We both went draw attach pass. I got one Archeops out with a B star and then just one. Uh, game two, I just hit Lost Vacuum. Like as as long as you're not like, as long as you're Lugia and you play Lost Vacuum, you're probably fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, and I mean like goes... the the Rayquaza kind of just like can one shot that. It can. Drill it on. I mean Pablo lost in top eight. I 
I, I didn't watch the end of game two, but it sounded like he misplayed. Um, yeah, he did. He I don't put, remember. Yeah. yeah, he put two of the same energy on and thought it, oh, yeah. it counted and it yeah. yeah through the game, basically. I think he had the mm. KO, though. I'm pretty sure he had... I think he had to put a psychic energy on. I think he had the energy to to get the KO, mm -hmm. but he just thought that it was like too fighting. I think he had like too fighting on, right? He thought it was too too the same energy it was was allowed mm -hmm. to be used. But he probably could have won that game if he didn't misplay there. But we don't yeah, know. Yeah, like sure you have the one shot potential, but like your margins are just so tight and like fighting everything. Because um, a lot of times they'll try to make you take three knockouts. Like they'll go Arceus, Arceus, Rally Don, or Arceus, Rally Don, Rally Don, uh, and then. Like, it's very hard, especially when it's the second Rally Dawn, it's very hard to get two 320s plus Goon. Um, yeah. Like, I, I hadn't lost to the matchup when I was testing Rayquaza for San Diego, but it definitely was close. Like, they were one to two prizes. If I, like, brick for a turn, that yeah, would have been really bad. Especially with the yeah. constant stream of Marnies. Yeah, yeah. If, they, if they're able to Marnie you all the time, that's, like, Rayquaza's biggest weakness is sometimes his hand disruption. Not just Lost it's... Box in general, I feel. I don't know. Yeah. I think that, uh, I guess, what are your thoughts on the Kyogre deck? I know uh, Grant's team has been really kind of gassing it up. And I know Grant himself has even said, like, he thinks he's found, like, the best way to play now that they have the Dragonite, which kind of answers mm -hmm. Duraludon and Ice Q. And I guess now Gudra, which is starting to pop back up. Does Dragonite go through effects of attacks? Yeah, it has uh, it the first a attack, Shred. shred yeah, just 50. Yeah. yeah, that's mm -hmm. pretty good. Um, I think it is definitely better than the Raikou V for Lugia. Mm -hmm. um because it doesn't get countered by sparse um i think it's also pretty good with the uh new i don't know what it does 250 if you play like the new seal stone from crown zenith that could be pretty interesting yeah. um i think raikou v or just like v pokemon and lost like mirage gate lost box get much better with that card but yeah uh i think yeah. kyogre yeah, I agree. is like probably the most difficult variant i Actually, I think Sable's Art is the most difficult to play, just based on it being, like, the worst version into Lugia, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, yeah. But it, it, overall, I think Kyogre is the most difficult to play, because, like, every deck, every each Lost Box gets punished for resources, but, like, sometimes, but a lot of times with Kyogre, it's much more resource-heavy in terms of, like, you'll need that one recycler, or I don't know how many recyclers they play. Um, yeah, pretty like two, Rick Walsh of brain right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Also, like, when you have the one, like, you hit Kyogre and one other super important card, and you're like, oh, I guess I have to throw away the super important card. It's mm -hmm. really awkward. Yeah, the, the Kyogre deck's pretty tough to play. It's also, like, even if you do, you know, if you don't, like, loss on away important resources, you have to be, like, very mindful of how much energy you're managing. Because mm -hmm. you do want, you need to have, I think, like, at the minimum, probably, like, seven energy in the discard, because you want to go Rod, Attach, yeah. Mirage Gate, and then Recycler five energy back, and then go Kyogre, so... Very, very resource management heavy deck. Very, yeah, very hard deck to play. Um, I don't know. I, I do like it though. I think the Dragonite's really cool. It does fix a lot of the. It does fix your bad matchups. Like it can be Drought on. It can be Gudra. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I, th I think that it might be maybe not the optimal way to play, but at least like if if you're good with the Kyogre build, I think that it maybe is the best deck in the room um, per se. And I do think, yeah, that the new Sky Seal Stone might give it a big upgrade because now you can go like Dragonite for three prizes against like a Lugia or an Arceus. So against like yeah. Duraludon, you yeah, against Duraludon, you can now just go knock out Arceus, take three prizes, and then kind of loop the Dragonite against Duraludon and then win the game from there. So yeah, I mean, you could just like soften it up with like a Snorlax for 180. So even if they hyper potion, or you could do uh, 210 with the belt. So even if they hyper potion, they're like down to 90 or 60 with uh, what's it called? Uh, I don't know if they play Goon now. I think Goon is really good in Lost Box, but yeah, I, 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 think I don't know. They, they play, like, now. four pretty different lists at this point, so I, I don't mm -hmm. know which is which, but yeah. Yeah, and they have, like, the Zera Aura with the Fruit yeah. Tree cost, and then they got the Snorlax and the, the Dragon Egg. Yeah. yeah, they don't play Goon, I don't think. It's more, like, if they play, like, Fortune mm -hmm. Energy, they play, like, three Captures, five Water, three Lightning, three Psychic, uh, and, like, a Poke Stop. They actually, they only play, like, a, they only play, like, two rope two switch card i think and then like four net so because they have to commit too much space for um a lost box mirage gate because like rayquaza is usually mm. only four to five as well um oh, okay, yeah. some combination of them probably played, yeah. like four rope no switch card um nick moffitt played three cart two rope something like that i don't mm -hmm. know they're they're very inconsistent but yeah it's i guess uh I guess one thing about the ray deck what do you think about the zapdos idea especially if like e-turn gets more popular I, I don't know. I'm 
not scared of E turn. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. I think there was someone who went like seven one one day one with E turn at San Diego, and then they barely bubbled into top sixty four. Like, yeah, I think it was. I think they I won, think it was like, a Ryan one. who did that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like, it, it seems like a pretty good day know. one deck, but not a yeah. great day two Ma- deck. Day two deck. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. It, it's one of those things. Like, I feel like Mew is a pretty good. It, it's it's in a pretty similar spot. Like, it's a good make day two deck, but it's not a good day two deck. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, we'll we'll have to see, I guess, what happens because I guess going into Orlando, there is a couple new cards. I guess one thing, other thing. Do, what do you think about the the new Zamazenta for Lost Box? I guess you have to play it in the Ray deck. Do you think it's a good thing to play, um, or do you just not bother? Like it's it's fine. Um, I don't know. It does the same thing as Snorlax Belt. I guess you need one less card. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. It, it's nothing crazy. You kind of need one more card, though, because you need specifically to attach a, a metal instead of just having three colorless. Also, you could yeah. go Raihan Twin with Snorlax. I think they're about the same. I don't I don't think it's that much. I don't think it's as important as people are making it to be. I do think... I think it was, like, Arlington or something. Michael Pramwell played, like... What was in it? Um, Amazing Rare Raikou and Amazing Rosation. I think it's pretty good in that because both those already have metal attachments. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's, I, if I buy into the hype on that card, I don't know if it's that good compared to like Snorlax or whatever, right? So, yeah, yeah it might I, mean, be I feel like Snorlax is a very good card. <laughs> yeah. The better card yeah, for Snorlax Lost Box is, is definitely the, the Seal Stone, I think. Yeah, the the new Seal Stone, like that would actually give me more incentive to play something like Drapion or Raikou or Dragonite yeah, in your deck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for 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 those listening slash watching who don't know what the new um, seal stone is, it's the sky seal stone seal stone from the Crown Zenith set. So you do have to attach it to a Pokemon V, um, kind of like a, so it's like a tool card, and if it's a Pokemon V, they can use the V Star power on it, which is an ability, and it's called it star order i suppose and it reads during this turn if your opponent's active pokemon v star or v max is ko'd by damage from your basic pokemon v's attack take one more prize card so you know if that's a drapion in your lost box deck that's knocking out a mu v max or taking four prize cards nice. which is kind of insane yeah yeah it, it's tempo is good yeah. and it, yeah and even again in the lost box deck if you're playing the raikou or the dragonite uko like a lugia then you're taking three prizes and that's actually good when the tempo of Lu because a lot of the time lugia can just knock out raikou and then go stoutlin yeah. and there's so like four prize game plan so the 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 seal stone will make it easier to beat that deck and actually might incentivize like something like raikou to see play again yeah, because I think Raikou, uh, after LAIC, uh, people realized that Lugia, it doesn't do much against Lugia because Lugia is like a one prize deck. Uh, we mm-hmm. saw that with like the Kyogre testing group. Uh, they switched to Zekrom and then they switched to Zera Aura. They switched to the one prizers. But now that you're having a favorable trade, a uh, two prize into three prize, it's definitely a lot better. Especially if you're playing like the two to three Raihan in the Rayquaza builds. Yeah, yeah. I like. I think Raikou's just cool because like it. You can also just like in weird scenarios, you can also bench it passively, and it it kind of does mm-hmm. apply a bit of a threat because if your opponent's you know filling their bench and you're able to, you, the Lightning Rondo can do like still like two twenty damage, and then later on down the road, you can Sableye kind of like fixes that math and stuff. So I still really like the idea of it. It's just it did struggle against Lugia where the the prize trade wasn't even in your favor. So, but it does mm-hmm. get a lot better with the Seal Stone, and I think that it it might actually kind of be the new kind of norm to play that in, in the uh, Lost Zone deck now. So. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I didn't. I honestly didn't even know what the Sky Seal Stone was. I haven't looked too much at the Crown Zenith. Um, I've just been like hearing from the Grapevine that there's not too many cards that are going to necessarily affect the meta. So I haven't really yeah. been, haven't really been diving too much into it before Orlando, which I should do because reading this, I'm like, this is actually pretty dirty. And I mean, especially with with things like Drapion or. Yeah, that's 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 a dirty card. That's a dirty, dirty card right there Very for dirty, sure. Yeah. yeah, you're probably gonna have to play with like Raihan though to find it. Cause yeah. I don't think you're gonna be able to find it fast enough. So, like, you I probably would fit better in the Rayquaza deck. I don't like. I don't think you're gonna play in the Kyogre deck at all. I think it's more just oh, played yeah, in Rayquaza. Oh, I don't play yeah. the Kyogre deck, so no worries here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it works pretty well in like the Nick Moffat build because he already played the four Seal Stone and quite a few Vs. Uh, yeah, I think Zapdos definitely becomes a bit better with the. Ability to take three. Pri- I don't know what, like, what's even weak to fighting besides E turn. I don't know. I, I mean, Vigavolt, but like, oh yeah, Zapdos is really good against Vigavolt. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I do think that Zapdos is really good against uh, Vika Volt too, because they'll bench a lot of Vs, and you can one-shot the Vika Volt. They can sometimes Raikou knock you out, but if they're attacking with Raikou, they're probably just losing the game at that point. So, and I mm -hmm. guess it helps against Arc Dura too, because you can. It's a good way to oh, knock yeah. out the Arceus, and then you can Rayquaza blow up to Duraludon. So That's maybe worse. it just, yeah. So it might be worth playing Zapdos in. The, or uh, the I mean, deck. if you do the if you do the Zapdos, take out the Arceus, and then if you're if you are able to actually knock out just one V Max or Aladon V Max. Well, no, because no, that needs to be a touch to a V. Yeah, it wouldn't work with uh, Raid. It'd be cool if it did, but unless I was say, unless that'd be opponent... absolutely crack, you, you could, but, like, like you have to. You can try to two-shot it, but with Hyper Potions and, like, the Crystal Cave, it gets kind of awkward. Um, yeah. yeah. Probably not you, know, you need to, like, actually, hit with the you... and they don't play Snorlax. Yeah, yeah, what you could do, I guess, is um, try to make it to where you're one-shotting a V-Star, an Arceus V-Star with the Zapdos, and you take three prizes on that, and then you just talk, knock out one Duraludon on V-Max. There's just six prizes, I guess. Yeah, that probably works, actually, to be honest. And then, yeah. You just have to do one Rayquaza hit on that Duraludon. Hmm. Mm. To the lab. Yeah, I definitely want to try that when it comes out on Thursday, for sure. I definitely think it could be a good poll for uh, Orlando. We'll have to see what people end up bringing. But honestly, I think it's a good place to maybe wrap up today's episode. We've got a pretty good discussion going on again about Lost Box and about uh, Piper's accomplishments and her journey so far. So, uh, yeah, I guess before I wrap anything up, do you all have anything you want to kind of – any last thoughts before we kind of wrap it up here? I don't. I guess, Piper, if you uh, want to plug some of your socials, Twitter or whatever else, where we can find you, where the, the audience can find you to get more get more Piper information in their lives. Uh, yeah, I, I just have Twitter. Um, it's just my name, at Piper Lapine. Uh, so... Yeah, and I guess all I have to say is Crown Zenith is a very bad set, except for the art. That is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. It's a really good collector set. It's a really good <laughs> yeah. collector set. Yeah, very good collector Definitely. set. Definitely. Can't wait to add to my book of cards that I never look at. Mm -hmm. So, excited yeah. for that. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay, well, I guess that's it. Until next time. The Shuffle Squad is proudly sponsored by Atlas Collectibles, the best place to buy any trading card game product online. Visit atlastcg.com and at the checkout screen, make sure to use code TSS12 to save an unbeatable 12% off your entire order. Atlas Collectibles will ship your product anywhere in the world, so make sure you're taking advantage of the 12% savings with TSS12. And if Pokemon is not your thing, don't worry. Go to atlastcg.com and see all the other amazing trading card game products they have there to offer. The Shuffle Squad has partnered with PTCGO Store to provide our community with the best access to Pokemon TCG codes. They have codes available 24-7, instant email delivery, and you can save 5% off by using code TSS5. If you're a YouTube member or Patreon supporter, you'll have access to a special code that gets you 10% off. So what are you waiting for? Use code TSS5 today and save 5% on your next order of codes on any codes available at ptcgostore.com. Poka X Word, the best place to get your fill of Pokemon-inspired puzzles. New puzzles are posted every day, and they recently launched a new Guess That Pokemon puzzle, which is a ton of fun to play. Go check them out at pokaxword.com and be sure to follow them on Twitter for your chance to win a ton of PTCGO codes every month. Check out the Late Night Series Season 6, brought to you by myself, Zach Lesage, and the Shovel Squad. We're going to be running a bunch of sick events for the Pokemon community, and they start on August 30th. So one thing you might be noticing here is that there's an EU time and an NA time. We have one at 12 p.m. Eastern, which works out to about 5 p.m. in London. And then we have one at 7 p.m. Eastern, which should help out a lot of players on the West Coast play in this event. That being said, we still have a lot of cool things going on. Expect similar prizing that we've had for other late night series events. Expect better staffing. Except, expect better tournament experiences. And of course, we do have a stream going up for this season as well, and I will be streaming the event on Twitch. That being said, we have the whole season up on the Play Limitless website. Late night 51 all the way through 70 runs until we hit the, region, the Invitational on November 5th. So check that out, sign up today, and support Zach Lesage Events and the Shuffle Squad. See you there.